Okay, well, welcome everybody to the 285 Corridor Tea Party. Um, we're excited to have you here and a great turnout tonight. So thank you very much for coming. Um, uh, we'll start off here with the invocation. And Ron, are you available to come up here for that? Join me in prayer. Uh, good evening, Father. We thank you for a beautiful day. We thank you that you care about uh, what we do and what we say. We invite you here tonight that uh, the things we say and do might be pleasing to you. And uh, Father, we're concerned about our country. And we would pray for our country and we pray for those who are in charge, and we're not always sure who that is, but Father, we, we pray for our president, we pray for his cabinet, we pray for those in the state house and our congress, we pray that they might be people who honor you and seek your will. I would ask you to uh, bless this evening, and uh, these things we ask you, Christ our Lord, amen. Make a face the flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Okay, well, we'll start off um, a little bit here, just kind of running through the agenda for tonight. Um, we do have, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what the 285 Corridor Tea Party is for anyone who might be new. And then um, we'll also do announcements. Um, as we go through the announcements, we've got some club announcements we'll do first, and then uh, we'll have two minute announcements. That's an opportunity for anybody in the room to stand up and talk about a club that might be meeting or any other kind of meeting that might be going on. And then we will have the candidates also will go around the room and ask the candidates to stand up and introduce themselves. And, and uh, if you would um, try and keep that to two minutes, we'll, uh, uh, you're welcome to come up here, uh, anyone that is doing the announcements so that you can speak from the front. Um, and, uh, but try and keep those to two minutes because we do have a, a large number of people tonight. Um, we do have, uh, um, then we will, at the, at, then after that we will have our featured speakers. And right now we have Ken Buck that will be coming in around, he'll be here a little bit later, I think. I haven't seen him here yet. And um, also Laura Boggs, is she here? Not yet, okay. Um, and then uh, Jeff Schrader and Jim Shires will also be talking. So you might get more time, who knows, we'll see here. Um, but uh, uh, Ken Buck, of course, is running for the US Senate. And Laura Boggs is a former Jeffco school board member. And as many of you know, there's a lot going on right now in the Jefferson County School Board. If you're on my email list, you've been seeing some of that going on. And uh, um, so she's gonna give us a, a quick briefing on some of that. Um, I, I wanted to touch on, because we are in election season, and so I wanted to touch on this issue briefly. Um, we uh, Kind of how the 285 Corridor Tea Party handles endorsements and uh, what our thinking is with that, because this comes up every election year. So as a, as the bottom line is the 285 Corridor Tea Party does not endorse candidates or issues. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because when you start endorsing candidates, things come down a lot of times to personality. You can have two conservative candidates that uh, based on their principles are very similar, but then a lot of times it comes down to a question of personality. And what happens is if you do endorsements at that point, all you do is end up dividing the group. And this, this is a club that is focused on principles, not personalities, and so for that reason, we do not do endorsements. Now the other reason we don't do endorsements is because um, as soon as you start doing endorsements, then you run into issues with campaign finance law. And so we also want to make sure that we avoid that. Um, and Sometimes you can catch me and I'll, I'll tell you my opinion on campaign finance law, but it essentially is just a, a way of sculpting free speech in my opinion. But um, it, it's real and we have to deal with it. And, and so uh, for those two reasons, we don't do endorsements. So instead, the, the question is, what do we do? 
And, and the main reason for the Tea Party to exist, in my opinion, is we have our principles and we're about transparency and accountability. And what that means is that um, any elected official, we are holding them up to the light to see what they're actually doing and, and holding them accountable for their actions once they're in office. Candidates, we're doing a similar thing. We're holding them up to the light and asking their positions and trying to um, understand where they're coming from. And we use that to determine how we want to vote. So that's, that's our policy towards endorsement. Um, so what does this 285 corridor Tea Party stand for? There we go. Um, basically, there are three principles that define the, the 285 corridor Tea Party's principles. Um, those are fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free market. And so um, what we do, the principles that we support are right up there. And um, there are many other issues, of course, that are involved in politics and determine where candidates are going to stand and everything else. But these are the principles we focus on. They're, they're the issues when we hold the candidates up to the light. We try and focus on these things. I've got to get my uh, computer elevated back there so that it'll pick that up better. Um, so we do have two meetings within the 285 corridor Tea Party. We have this meeting where we bring in speakers and um, we, we, uh, this is an opportunity to kind of educate yourself, talk about the principles. And we have decided that right now because of election season and uh, especially prior to the primary, we're going to focus more on candidates than issues. But um, especially during non-election years, you'll find that we have a big focus also on issues. Um, we also, outside of this, do have an activist meeting. The activist meeting, this is where you come, you can learn about what's happening. Um, at the activist meeting, that is a roll up your sleeves, let's get the work done type of meeting. And um, we uh, have one request of all activists, and that is that if you come to the meeting, that you are willing to commit at least an hour of your time outside of the meeting to getting work done. We don't have any speakers. It's all about, it's all about um, getting involved in the election process and winning elections ultimately. Um, we do have a number of projects that we're working on. Uh, voter integrity, um, the DEFCO GOP caucus project, and the technology project, which is uh, we, we are um, building a database essentially that, that uh, we're going to hope to leverage. Um, over time, this database will become more and more valuable. Right now, hopefully everybody has received one of my emails about what we're doing with that, but we have had a calling campaign within Jefferson County, and we've had a number of people make a number of phone calls. So we've, we've gotten um, about 1,500 phone calls made through that system where we're actually trying to find out where people stand and um, trying to find out how we can uh, how we can message and do different things through that phone call system. So if you are not currently calling, this is something that we're trying to do a big push, especially before caucus. We are trying to make sure that like-minded folks get out to the caucuses and we could use your help. So if you've not received my email for some reason or whatever the case may be, you'll stop over here and talk to Eva or talk to me after the meeting. Let me know, but we could really use your help over the next week here making those phone calls. This isn't working very well. <laughs> okay, so now we'll move on into announcements. Um, one of the things that I do like to point out are just some resources that are available for you. Um, in Jefferson County now we have this Tea Parties, um, JeffcoTeaParties.com website, and we are posting on that website all of the Jefferson County Tea Party meetings, as well as the Arapahoe Tea Party meeting, which is the only other Tea Party that is meeting in the metro area. So we have um, all six of those Tea Party meetings are posted there, but in addition to that, we are posting information about the school board meetings. We're posting information about the um, county council, uh, county board meetings, and um, Lakewood, I believe the Lakewood City Council is currently posted, so we're hoping to have a lot of these government meetings that, um, that are open to the public posted up there for you to be able to find out about, and uh, that's also a good place to go and see who the speakers will be at different meetings around the county. Um, then, of course, we do have our website. If you're interested in being on our email list and you're not currently, Go up to our website, there's a tab that says subscribe on it, and if you just fill in the information, then you'll be on our email list and start receiving those. 
Um, and then these two websites down here, what I like to uh, talk about are, we, we talk about our purpose being accountability and transparency. Um, accountability really comes down to how do elected legislators vote? And there are two, um, there are two groups that we pay attention to. Those are Principles of Liberty and ColoradoTaxpayers.org. Uh, cut, and may have, you may have heard it called that, um, Colorado Union of Taxpayers. But both of those websites I highly recommend as far as resources for finding out how legislators are voting and, um, and holding them accountable. They, they both have a scoring system where they rate the legislators. So before November 2014, I hope you'll go out there and especially if you're voting for someone who's an incumbent, check out their record because a lot of times what they say in the meeting isn't exactly how they vote. So you need to keep an eye on that. I may have to, uh, there we go. Okay, so again, there are five key parties in Jefferson County, and um, you can find out more about them at that website, jeffcoteaparties.com. Uh, we're really using that, we're really pushing that as a resource for people in Jefferson County. Um, also, um, the other thing I wanted to announce is that 285 Corridor Tea Party can always use help, and especially in the area of technology, we've got kind of a technology deficit within uh, the activist group. And uh, so if we can get some help with Excel or uh, if you're good on the, uh, good with websites or anything like that, we could definitely use some help with technology. Um, we do have also a vacant seat on the board if anybody is interested in talking to me about that. And then also the other thing is we can always use a bigger crowd here. So we're encouraging everyone to bring a friend at the next meeting and so we'll hope you'll do that. One person, everybody bring one person and we'll, we'll continue to grow. Um, things coming up include the, the most important thing that we are focused on is the caucus. And um, that's coming up on March the 4th, and that'll be in the evening. Um, for people who live right in this area, there's been a change to the location. There's a couple of things I kind of wanted to point out here. Uh, there has been a change to the location. Um, and uh, so for some people, um, some people were in West Jeff Middle School, and there were, I believe, four um, district captains that were holding things there. Now two of them are there and two of them are at the high school. So the re reason I bring this up is I don't have the information about where you specifically need to go. You'll have to get that information on your own. But if you're just used to going to West Jeff Middle School, you do need to check and make sure that that's still where it's going to be. Um, also, um, uh, let's see, basically, well, for those of you who might not be familiar with the caucus process, I wanted to talk about the end results of it. What is it, why are we holding these caucuses, and why should you care? So there are really two things that come out of the caucus process, the first one being precinct committee people. Now precinct committee people are people who are involved with the party. Um, they, um, they're specifically tasked with connecting with the community, holding community events, inviting people to, to get involved in the Republican Party or the Democrat Party, but, but uh, getting people involved in the, in the party structure is what a precinct committee person does. Um, they also have a vote. So if, you're, if you want to have some input into what the county GOP is doing, then you have to get involved as a precinct committee person. These are the people who will influence the party. Now the other, the other important thing that comes out of these um, caucuses are delegates. Delegates, in a nutshell, are the people who will go and select the candidates um, who are going to be on primary ballot. So you can think of it that way. If you're, if you're not happy with the slate that's coming out, you, you look at uh, the ballot in November and you're not happy with who's on there, well, your delegates have contributed largely to those, those names. And so this is an opportunity at the caucus, both precinct committee people and delegates will be elected. And so this is the opportunity for you to influence the party, and it's a, a separate opportunity for you to influence the candidates that are actually on the ballot. So I encourage you to get involved. It's uh, coming up very quickly here next next week on Tuesday. Yes. Everybody needs to check where they are because our our precinct has moved. It's no longer where were we last year? Well, we were at Wilmot last week, last time. And so now we're at the high school. So people have to check. 
So what Donna was saying was that people have moved even in, in Evergreen. So a number of the uh, caucus meetings have moved. The other thing that's important, and this is going to create some confusion, is that precinct numbers have changed. So from 2012 to 2014, whatever precinct number you had before, you may have it, may have had it memorized or you thought you've got it written down on a piece of paper, it doesn't mean a thing anymore. Those have been translated into new precincts. You should have received, so Jefferson County did send out a uh, mailer on this and you should have received notice that your precinct has changed in the mail. And um, if you didn't, then you'll need to find out about that. Um, also, when you do go in to the, pre uh, to the caucus, most, at most of the caucuses, they should have a table set up where they can look up what precinct you're in. But, but just uh, don't, don't wander in, wander past the table thinking you know your precinct from last time you were there. Um, Art, do you have anything else that you wanted to add on that? Uh, not right now. No? I'll use my two minutes. Okay, very good. Lauren? Yes. Yes, Beth. If they will go to getcoderepublicans.com, right on the home page. <laughs> if you'll go to getcoderepublicans.com, right on the home page, can be real obvious for you to go and figure out what your precinct number is, and once you know that, then you can tell where you're going, where you will go for the caucus. The other thing is, this varies from uh, precinct to precinct in terms of how well the contacts are being made. But I know there is a concerted effort to make phone calls to people too, so you may be receiving phone calls. But uh, so phone calls, mail, Jeffco Republicans website, JeffcoRepublicans.com, um, and all of those are great resources for finding out. Just just know that a lot has changed since the last time you went. Um, also, um, I, I mentioned earlier that we've got the 285 activist group that meets, and this is the roll up your sleeves group that I was talking about. The um, activist meeting is scheduled for the day before caucus. And what we're encouraging everyone to do is instead of that, to spend the next week helping us make phone calls. So we, we are canceling the 285 activist meeting and we're asking that anybody that is interested in getting involved and being active spend not only that night, but also the next week making phone calls to help us get people out to the polls or out to the caucus. The, the caucus is on the 4th, correct? Next Tuesday. So not this, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. So if you have any questions about that, we have sent out, I don't know if every, out of curiosity, is there anybody in here who is not on our email list? No? Okay. We, we have sent out emails on the uh, phone conferencing. Um, we will do additional training on that if anyone is interested in making those phone calls. Essentially what we're doing is we're just doing a call canvassing and we're calling people up and, and finding out whether or not they want to get more involved in the political process and then um, trying to engage like-minded Tea Party activists in the political process. So that's essentially what we're doing. Um, we've got a website that is cut, that, that is built just for this initiative. Um, there's somebody in the South Jeffco Tea Party that actually built it for us. And what it does is it pops up a name and a number and there are a number of questions that you kind of go through. It's a phone script just like any other. You're looking at it in your browser and you're calling from your house, either on your cell phone or your home phone landline, and uh, you just go through and like I said, we've done about 1,500 phone calls so far. Um, also, uh, next month we do have uh, another meeting, of course, same time. We're always meeting on the fourth Monday, and we have Scott Gessler and Steve House, who are both candidates for the Colorado, for Colorado governor, and also Owen Hill, who is a candidate for U.S. Senate. So. These are uh, big statewide races. There are a number of candidates involved, and um, so we encourage you to come out and find out more about that. Um, also, at this time, I uh, just kind of want to thank everybody for again for being here. But uh, we do have costs, and we do have um, uh, a lot of things that we're working on. All of these things cost money. Various initiatives for the phone calls and everything else require computers, and we're purchasing lists, and we're doing various different activities. So we do need financial support for that. And uh, so at this time, I think Eva, or Eva, if you'll start, very good. Eva's gonna go ahead and pass the basket here. And um, we definitely would appreciate your support. 
And I need a new clicker, too, so. <laughs> okay, so with that, we'll just kind of open things up. And are there any other two-minute announcements? And if there are, you can go ahead and come on up here and go ahead and make them if you'd like. And actually, if, if you would like, um, if there are additional announcements, if you want to go ahead and walk up here to the front, that way we can kind of move through this quickly. This Thursday night, the 27th, Mountain Republican Women's Club will have their first regular meeting here. So uh, we have um, decided to no longer be at High Long Golf Club, but uh, we will be meeting here as Ron's graciously opened this up for us. So Karen Mill is our president, and um, she's in another meeting tonight, so I'm making the announcement. Seven to nine. Beverly McAdam, President North Jeffco Republican Women. <clears throat> Our meeting is the second Tuesday of the month at 100th and Wadsworth, so that's a drive for some of you. Um, in March's meeting, we're on, actually, Ken Buck will be there, so if you have a neighbor that um, missed tonight and wants to hear Ken, they should come to North Jefferson County Republican Women. Um, in addition to Ken, we have three gubernatorial candidates, Greg Brophy and Steve House and Mike Cop, and we'll also have Don Itterberg, who is running for CG7. So, you all be welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Aaron Roller. I'm your area coordinator for uh, House District 25. And uh, I just want to make a, a few things. Uh, it is extremely important at the caucuses that we elect two precinct uh, committee people per precinct. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and this helps run the party uh, in the county party. Like you determine uh, the agenda, uh, the platform, things like that. So uh, being a uh, person that belong to the central committee is extremely important. Now, uh, for those that like to become delegates, or own it to the county party. Uh, uh, after the fourth, uh, and you get your name on what we call the minutes, uh, the county party will meet at the Mile High Church on the 22nd of March. I believe that's a Saturday. The fee is $15 for each delegate and $15 for each all it. So if you plan to uh, want to be an all it, there's a great opportunity because we'll be looking for Lots of alternates and delegates to attend um, the uh, county assembly. I didn't take my two minutes, so I came back up. Um, we also need volunteers immediately after caucus. When all that information comes into Jeffco headquarters, we have to review all of the minutes, check out the money. It's a big job and we would love help with shifts. You can work 8 to 12, 12 to 4. Um, go to jeffcorepublicans.com and you can sign up to help. Thank you. Uh, Dan, you're, we might need a new clicker and a new mic stand. Um, Okay, so with that, um, I also, any of the, uh, any candidate who is here that would like to go ahead and take two minutes, introduce yourself, tell what you're running for, also, um, and we'll also do the same, same thing, have everybody kind of line up over here, if you would, and um, go ahead and take a couple of minutes, tell us what you're running for, and a little bit about yourself, and what you stand for, and Lou, go ahead. I stand for a limited government, and I've seen that before, we had a... I've been executive assessor in Jefferson County for the last, since 1999. We have reduced our workforce from 72 in 99 now to 55 at this time, which is a great deal of savings for taxpayers' money. Uh, I sent out about a thousand emails. Anybody get my emails from, uh, you got them? Okay, right on there is, is all the caucus locations. So hopefully you could open them up and that'll be helpful to you. Yeah, right, this thing's a little nuts here, but that's okay. Anyway, in, in May, you're going to be, I get it. In May, you're going to be getting a notice, evaluation from the county. That's right. And at that time, you get 30 days to protest your values. 
on the back of that form is the sheet that you need to fill out and send it in. Check the form, make sure your spelling is correct, make sure the address is correct, and make sure the property description is correct. And you, remember, you only have 30 days to do it, and if you don't get it done in 30 days on the state law, you can't even come in and talk to us about it until January, that's six months down the road. And sometimes the state is backed up about a year that for you to come back in and have hearings at the county. So in our case, come in early, we'll take care of you, we'll work with it, and uh, I need your support in the assembly in, uh, in November. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Tim Kaufman. Uh, I'm the Jefferson County Treasurer. Glad to be with you tonight. Uh, my background before becoming Treasurer four years ago was in uh, Treasury management and the commercial banking. And also, I moonlighted for a number of years during that time as a Westminster City Councilman. So becoming Treasurer has been a good uh, marriage between my Treasury and finance background as well as local elected office. Uh, the Jefferson County Treasurer's Office uh, has three primary functions. We serve as the county's banker. We manage and safeguard the county's investment portfolio, which I consider your money. And then uh, one little thing that we do is we uh, uh, collect property taxes. This is kind of a dangerous week to be speaking about this because the first half payments are due at the end of the week. So. Um, but it, it'd be best that you not give your checks to me tonight. That's probably not the most reliable way. Uh, I, I take uh, the, the duty seriously, uh, and managing the money is something that we spend a lot of time and care doing, making sure that the money is safe. And I'd also say that the other thing that I work hard at doing is making sure our office is efficient and responsive to you as the taxpayers. Uh, it, it's a pain to pay property taxes, and we shouldn't make it any harder than it really is. So. I'm up for re-election this fall, and I'd appreciate your support. Tim Kaufman, Jefferson County Treasurer. Are there any other two-minute announcements or any other candidates that would like to announce anything? Okay. Um, what we're going to do is go ahead and uh, transition now into um, our primary speaker segment. And Tim Buck has driven here. Uh, he's got a good drive home, probably uh, an hour, hour and a half, something like that. So um, we are going to let him speak first. Um, just a little bit about Ken. He is a native of Greeley. He uh, graduated from Princeton University and played football there. Um, he he's also a graduate. Um, of the University of Wyoming Law School. He worked for Congressman Dick Cheney, and then he went on to work for the U.S. Department of Justice. In 1990, he joined the Colorado U.S. Attorney's Office, and since 2004, Ken has been uh, the Weld County DA. He was elected and re-elected three times. Um, he has a staff of 60 people, and he ran for the U.S. Senate in 2010. Um, he's married to Colorado State Representative Perry Buck, and incidentally, we, we promote the Principles of Liberty website a lot as far as a metric for how people perform, and she is a, an all-star performer. Um, also, he has two grown, what's that? <laughs> yes, Perry is fantastic. She is, uh, she scores very high on uh, Principles of Liberty. Um, he also has two grown children, a son and a daughter, and uh, with that, I'd like to invite Ken Buck. That worked okay. Hi, folks. How are you? Um, tell me my, my time limits and constraints and when you're going to give me the hook. Sure. Um, what we'd like to do is have you uh, take about 15 minutes and then you can do uh, uh, leave some time for questions and answers. That'd be great. Okay, great. I will speak very shortly and I'd love to take some questions uh, from you folks. Um, Perry is a superstar uh, and I am so happy to be married to Perry. She is, uh, last year she was the president of the Colorado Federation of Republican Women and then uh, she has been involved in Republican women politics. She has been the state vice chair, the state secretary of the Republican Party. She has been the uh, county chair. Um, I am just uh, very fortunate. Some people 
uh, some couples uh, golf together and some couples fish together. Perry and I do politics together. And uh, uh, she was not political beforehand, so she really um, is a labor of love for Perry and, and she loves the state of Colorado. Uh, I wish all the legislators down there loved the state of Colorado, frankly. Um, folks, I want to tell you something. I talked to Ted Mink, your sheriff, um, about this. Uh, if you put this on your car, you will not get a speeding ticket. Okay? <laughs> he assures me. Okay, in case there are any Democrat trackers here, that was a joke. That was just a joke. What is true is the value of your car will go up. So <laughs> these are a hot commodity right now. Um, you know, I just uh, was down at the uh, South Metro Chamber of Commerce, and I had a lot of very interesting questions. And, and I love campaigning because uh, different people have different interests. And, and I imagine we'll be talking a little more about the Constitution here. They talked about business interests uh, uh, there. but. Um, I, I want to mention a few things quickly. Um, Mark Udall has voted 99% of the time with his party. And that is absolutely significant uh, for people around the state of Colorado to understand. And I have a theory. I think that the other 1% of the time he was distracted and hit the wrong button. I think, you know, why would you be a 99% voter? You're 100% of the time uh, uh, an empty suit, a tool for your party. So, uh, just a theory I have. But when he got to Washington, D.C., we had $5 trillion of debt. We now have, uh, soon we'll have $18 trillion of debt. When he got to Washington, D.C., gas was around a dollar a gallon. It's now three, three fifty four dollars a gallon. When he got to Washington, D.C., we had 19 million people on food stamps. Now we have 47 million people on food stamps. We are worse off now. Now, if he had voted, 60% with his party or 70% with his party, he would have an excuse. He could say, I, I did my best. I cast my vote for the people of Colorado. But when you vote 99% of the time with your party, there's only one thing you're doing, and that is you are supporting your party's principles in spite of the interests of Colorado. When I go to Washington, D.C., I will do the same thing that I have done as district attorney. I will represent the most vulnerable in our community. Folks, we are going to go off a cliff if we don't turn this around very quickly. That debt is unsustainable. And that's just, you know, the debt on one set of books. The Federal Reserve has $4 trillion of debt. There's $100 trillion or more of unfunded liabilities. Uh, we have to turn this around. We have to turn it around quickly. Um, I'm happy to go out in the back and, and plant some food, and, uh, and I'll find a way to survive. There are people that cannot survive an economic catastrophe in this country, and those are the people that I want to represent. Well, as district attorney, I work very hard to represent the most vulnerable, the people who have been raped or robbed or um, uh, have been victims of the crime through no fault of their own. And they come into my office, and I fight very hard, and I have for 25 years. And that's what I want to do in Washington, D.C. And frankly, we are in a mess in this country because of Republicans and Democrats, not just Democrats. We are in a mess in this country because of people who call themselves liberals and people who call themselves conservatives. And I am not going to, to fit with any label, and I am not going to allow my party to push me around. I am going there to have an independent voice, and I am going there to fight. <laughs> you got to give them a little more caffeine. I usually get a standing O on <laughs> uh, Okay, let's, uh, let's have some questions if we can. Um, Ken, I, I, if I could, I'd like to just kind of start this off. Um, we are coming up on caucuses, and one of the things that will come out of the caucuses are the opportunity to elect delegates. So what would you say to somebody in here who's thinking about running for a delegate position, and what distinguishes you from somebody else that other people that are running? What are there, 100 or 200 candidates now for U.S. Senate? Um, but uh, for, from the other U.S. Senate candidates. Yeah, uh, we have, um, we had, uh, last week, seven U.S. Senate candidates, and now we have six U.S. Senate candidates. There was a gentleman from, uh, there was a candidate from uh, Durango uh, who was a Democrat her whole life and changed to be a Republican and came into the, uh, uh, the process. But we have six candidates right now. Um, I, I would tell you the most important thing about being a delegate is to vote for 10 bucks. <laughs> the, the second most important thing is make sure our gubernatorial candidate is strong and we have two strong candidates at the top of the ticket, so that we, if we have one, the Democrats take all their firepower, and believe me, I know this, take all their firepower and aim one direction, and, and it is very difficult to win if, if you're the 
strong candidate um, without a strong candidate on that ticket. So uh, we need two strong candidates uh, on the ticket. Being a delegate is a wonderful learning experience. Uh, you, you, and I don't understand why the Republican Party chose to have its assembly in Boulder, but we are going to Boulder. Um, I hope we have a few converts along the way as a result of that. But uh, um, you go to you go to Boulder, and your voice is heard. And your voice is one of four thousand. When you vote in the primary, your voice is one of I don't know one hundred and fifty thousand. When you vote in the general election, your voice is one of two million. So you have a, a, a very powerful voice when, when you go to the, the Colorado State Assembly, Colorado Republican State Assembly, and I would encourage you to, to do that. And I would also encourage you, you know, you're active, you're here, you care, and that is so essential. If someone is going around the activist and paying people to stand outside King Supers and petition on, and we have some in the governor's race, and we have some in the Senate race, and we may have some uh, in other races, uh, shame on them. This is about coming to these meetings, looking Judy in the eye and saying, Judy, I want your support. I'm Ken Buck. Ask me your toughest question because I want your support. And if you can't do that, if you can't ask the activists for their support, when you get to November and you start looking around, you're not going to have people that are willing to make phone calls and knock on doors and put yard signs in and, and ask people for their support. It, this is where we win elections. We win elections in February, not in November. And so I would ask you to, to seriously consider the people who are going through the process uh, in a different way than you consider the people who are not going through the process. Yes, sir. Uh, given that you uh, win elections and go to the US Senate, what are the practical challenges to Andrew Obama? Obamacare? And actually, before you start that, what we'll do is Dave over on that side has a microphone, and we are uh, videotaping this, so we're going to try and have everyone talk into the microphone if they would. So. Um, but, uh, I'll repeat well, the question for okay, this purpose. Good. Yeah. Well, the question was, what practically will you do to undo Obamacare? Fair. Um, and and you've got to look at this in different time frames. The first thing that you have to do to undo Obamacare is uh, we have got to defund everything we can from uh, January of 2015 to January of 2017. Uh, President Obama is in office. This is his signature piece of legislation, and he's going to go down with a fight. So we are not going to be able to uh, pass legislation that replaces Obamacare until uh, we win the presidential election in 2016. Until we win the presidential election in 2016. That usually gets people to clap. You know, you, that's a cue for you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we'll, we'll do our best. We have to win the Senate. Um, we have to win six seats in the Senate. Um, and uh, we'll probably need to shoot for eight or nine seats uh, in the Senate because in 2016, we will be defending more seats than the Democrats will. So we've got to make sure we have a, a cushion there. 2016, um, we uh, can then start, or 2017, we can then start working on uh, the, the real issue that you're talking about. How do we replace Obamacare? I am a, and it was so good to see one of your principles with free market. I am a free market person. I don't believe government has the answers in education. I don't believe they have the answers in health care. I don't believe they have the answers in energy. And so I, I believe that we need to uh, bring some free market principles into health care. And, and we had some in place before. When you go buy auto insurance, that's, how, that's the kind of system we want in place when you are, are looking at health care. We want to make sure that we have tax incentives for people to uh, put pre-tax money aside, not just employers, but employees, to put pre-tax money aside. So you can get a high deductible plan if you're young and healthy, you can get a high deductible plan, and you could be saving money for your health insurance and your health care costs uh, down the road. Um, if, you're, if you're my age, I had cancer last year, um, I think that you know I, I don't want as high a deductible, I can get a lower deductible plan. Um, and I can pay higher premiums uh, as a result of that. But those are my choices. The government doesn't tell me that I need maternity coverage. The chances of me having a child in the next 30 years of my life are very slim. I also don't need substance abuse coverage. You know what? Not going to happen for Ken Buck. So let me choose the things that I need in my coverage. Give me freedom. That's what I want. I want the government to get out of the way. I want to be able to buy an insurance plan from Illinois if it's the best plan, not necessarily from Colorado. So let's have uh, the ability to buy plans uh, interstate. 
let's let's make sure that we don't allow the, the trial lawyers to, to raise the cost of health care. So let's have tort reform in place. Now this comprehensive health care coverage called Obamacare, the comprehensive health care bill called Obamacare, they refused to go after one of their own constituencies, the trial lawyers. That's that's shameful. If you're going to pass something, and, and remember the process was completely corrupt when they passed it, and now we've got a bad policy. So when I deal with replacing Obamacare, I want to deal with it in incremental steps. I don't want to jam something down the American people's throat any more than I liked it when the Democrats did that. And if you go back to what I said earlier. I'm not going to be a, a, you know, a stooge for the Republicans any more than I want Mark Udall to be a stooge for the Democrats. So, so those are a few of the things. We're going to put a health care position paper on our website. And folks, you know, there's always a question, what can we do to help you get elected? Let me tell you something, whether it's me or somebody else, go to my website, go to my website, buckforcolorado.com, and we've got some palm cards over here with, with the website information on it. We've put up some really powerful videos. Have you seen those videos? Powerful videos that attack the other side. They keep saying, well, you're pro-life, therefore you hate women. You hate minorities. You hate, you hate, you hate. It's not true. I've spent 25 years of my life protecting women and helping women that have been raped and helping women who have been domestic violence victims and helping women who have gone through other terrible, uh, terrible things. And we're starting to get some of those women to do videos for us, and we're putting those videos up, and they're great testimonials. And I'd really appreciate it if you'd look at that. We have position papers. I'm not writing those you know, so I can figure out what I want to say in a debate. I'm writing those so I'm, I'm on record. You want to talk about transparency? Here's what I believe in in the scope of government. Let's have limited government. Let's have government decisions made at the lowest possible level. Read my scope of, of government paper. That's what I say. Read my energy paper. Um, and, and, and you know what? When I come back here next year as a United States Senator, because I hope I'll be invited and I will be here looking you in the eye, asking you for your support again, I want you to say, but wait, you said this on your energy paper. You voted this way. Tell me why. That's what a U.S. Senator does. He doesn't duck the hard questions. He votes the right way and he comes and he answers the question. And we have another question back there and we'll do one more question after this. So if anyone else wants to. Good evening, Ken. Tom McAdam here. Good to see um, you. Beverly and I and some of the other people in this room were at an event this weekend that had several speakers. And by accident or the, by design of the organizers, several of the speakers mentioned that we can all identify what failure looks like when we're talking about the governance of our country. But what we really need is a clear definition of what success is going to look like. And you kind of started down that talking about, you know, an alternative to Obamacare. But and I realize it's got to be someplace day after tomorrow. But can you kind of uh, quickly spell out for us what success in government governance looks like when you're there? Yeah, I'll be glad to. Let me tell you what success looks like, folks. It looks like. Uh, um, a country that you can live in without the NSA spying on you. Yeah. Yeah. Ask Senator Udall what he was doing on the Senate Intelligence Committee when he was being briefed about the spying that occurred against us. What it looks like is a country where you're free to start a business without 80,000 pages of government regulations that were written last year by the federal government. That's what, that's what this country should look like with a successful government. You know what this country looks like? You get to choose. Do you want 100% gasoline in your car? Do you want 90% gasoline and 10% ethanol? Do you want 50-50? You're a grown up. Let's give you the choice to choose what the blend is in your car. You want to pay more because a windmill produces your power and a solar panel produces your power? God bless you, pay more. You want to pay less because you're getting coal or natural gas? Go ahead, do that. Have some freedom in this country and let the market choose whether we're going to have an 80% or a 90% or a 100% uh, energy source coming from this area or that area. Now, am I saying we should have dirty pollution, uh, dirty, dirty air? No, I'm not saying that at all. Obviously, we've got to have some scientifically based regulations, not politically based regulations. We want to live in a country where we can understand the tax code. You know? 
give me a postcard, let me tell you how much I made, let me take a percentage of that, and let me send you a check. Period. End of story. Don't tell me that I've got to read volume after volume of tax code to understand what my tax liability is. That, those are the things that begin to explain what I think success looks like in America. Ken, how vulnerable would you say that uh, Mark Udall is? All right, I'll, I'll answer that question real quick. How many people in here are going to vote for Mark Udall? <laughs> what more do I need to say? Here, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about why I think he's very vulnerable. Um, the last poll showed Mark Udall at 45%, Ken Buck at 42%. It showed Ken Buck ahead of Mark Udall by eight points with unaffiliated voters. Now, the Denver Post doesn't talk about that. You know why? The Denver Post keeps saying, well, Ken Buck's behind Mark Udall 17 points with, uh, with women voters. Well, Mark Udall's behind Ken Buck by 16 points with male voters. What's the point? You know, who's going to win the election? Who's going to have the, the votes needed in November to win that election? The reason Republicans are not, uh, the Republicans are behind Mark Udall at this point is because we have a primary, and we have a number of people running in the primary. And so uh, a lot of the people that were asked said, if you were re to vote for Ken Buck or Mark Udall, they said, I'm undecided because I'm supporting, you know, another Republican primary. Well, when it comes time to, in November, you ask a Republican, are you going to support Ken Buck or Mark Udall? They're going to support Ken Buck. We are ahead in the real poll at this point, and, and, and that will become evident soon. So I think he's very vulnerable. Okay. Oh, we got one more. And this will be the last question. Name's Jake. Um, I have a question. We hear this from every candidate that comes to us because you're in a favorable area, according to a favorable defense, because you're telling us everything we want to hear. Hold that close to your mouth and I'll hear you. I'm sorry. That's okay. So, what makes you different when you get into Washington? and you all of a sudden turn into a rhino. <laughs> if you weren't bigger than me, I'd say those are fighting words. But <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, and I can't answer this very quickly, I'm sorry, but I've got to tell you this. Um, for Valentine's Day four years ago, I bought my wife a 9 millimeter pistol. <laughs> now, gentlemen, don't do it. It was a game changer. I'm a much more polite husband than I was before. <laughs> but you heard about how conservative my wife is. I come back from Washington, D.C., and I voted the wrong way. I've got to face her. She's an armed woman. I am not going to face an armed woman unless I <laughs> lost my marble. I have been a principled conservative since I started working as a prosecutor. If you look at my record in, in uh, Weld County, I am a principled conservative. I am not going to Washington, D.C. to be a career politician. I'm going there and, and, and going there to fight for the things that I said I would fight for. And the biggest issue that Republicans have and Democrats have is they go to D.C. and they try to get reelected right away. You try to get reelected, you're going to go to people like lobbyists and ask them for money and they're going to expect something in return. I will not compromise my values for lobbyists, for my party, or for anything else. I am accessible. Don't, don't clap. Don't clap because I'm going to run out of time. He's going to give me the hook. I am accessible. I'm coming back here. I'm looking you in the eye, and I'm asking you if I've done a good job year after year after year uh, when I'm in the United States Senate. And that's how I will stay in touch with the people. I will not be one of those people that hides in Washington, D.C. and doesn't answer the questions that need to be answered among the people. So I hope you trust me. Because if we let Mark Udall win again, we're in big trouble. My wife got it there in your Yeah. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Um, also, uh, our, uh, along the lines of uh, we are really emphasizing the caucus and um, uh, people running for delegates within the um, within the caucus process. So we're encouraging people to get involved with that. Art had something that you wanted to add about the state caucus? Right. All right, now, at the caucus uh, uh, night, uh, delegates will be elected. And I just picked a, a precinct number. I don't know if anybody's here in fifth, precinct 58 or not. But in precinct 58, you're going to elect or have the capability of electing six delegates to the county convention in four elements. That's 10 people. All right, now, are those 10 people then 
you can select two delegates to the state convention for Ken Buck, or you can select two alternates. That's four people. So we'll go to the state convention. That's going to be held at the Court of Events Center in Boulder on April 12th. Okay, now, the key, here's the downside. And I'll go back to what Tim said before, being the uh, treasurer. I'm not the treasurer, but I'll say it anyway. Each delegate and all in that to the county uh, is $15 each. If you want to go to the uh, delegate to the state convention, it's $60 for the delegate, $40 for the all in that. Okay, and it's payable on caucus night. So uh, if you're going to uh, want to be a delegate uh, to the county, it's 15 bucks. If you want to belong to the uh, go to the state and get elected, it's 15 dollars plus another 60. That's 75 dollars. Come prepared. We accept cash or check. So it's 15 bucks for the congressional. Uh, for con uh, second congressional, it's five dollars for the delegate, five dollars for the alderman. Five dollars. So if you want to be a, a congressional delegate, fifteen dollars plus another five. Yes. Uh, the second congressional will be held at Interlochen uh, Hotel on the uh, the afternoon. Uh, at the county. Very good. Thanks, Art. Um, Laura, I think I saw Laura. Are you here? Very good. Uh, also, as, as you know, I've been sending out emails on this, um, but there's a lot going on with the Jefferson County School Board. And Laura Boggs is a previous school board member. She was a former member, and um, she's very familiar with the process and what's going on. And she's uh, been very involved in things here recently too. And so she's going to give us an update on what's happening with the school board. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Lauren. It's nice to be here with so many presentations. Hi, Mr. Berta. It's a long weekend. Cross and cow. Oh, goodness. Um, I think what Lauren meant to say when he was talking about calendars, which is the reason that he gave you March 3rd off, is because he wants you all at Evergreen High School, where this uh, County Board of Education is going to have their budget forum, and they will be soliciting input for what the priorities for the 2014-2015 school year should be. So uh, Judy's going to make her phone calls right up till 4 o'clock, and then at 6 o'clock she's going to head over to Evergreen High School, and she's going to have her own table full of people, because you know they like to spread us all out, and then they put us at a table with seven or eight people, and we have our ideas, but the other four or five people have different ideas, and so our ideas get lost. So if you don't want that to happen, you find your friends. So look around this room tonight, figure out who's going to be at Evergreen High School on March 3rd, find those friends, sit with them. This is one of my friends right here, this is Jim Shires. He used to stand in front of me and take bullets when I was at that school board meeting. We also have a Jefferson County employee here. She runs Connections High School, and we just want to shout out for her because we are few and far between in Jefferson County. Actually, I think there's a lot more of us than we think there are. We just hide under the desks all the time. So Jim saying yes. Um, so, school board. How many of you know we have a five-member school board? And in our November election, we replaced three of those school board members. <laughs> and seriously, yes, yeah, stop, because you guys did it. Seriously, seriously, you guys did it. I gotta tell you, as much time, effort, and energy as um, we all put into that election, I think if we had um, pulled this room and we were all together on maybe November 1st, we would have said the probability was about less than 2% that we were gonna win. So in my world, that's God. That is a divinely inspired win and um, divinely inspired people who chose to run for the school board. Um, one of the reasons I asked Lauren and Dave if I could come up and speak is um, when we have conversations about public education, I think it's incredibly important to be accurate about what's going on. Look, here's my world. There's enough bad stuff going on. We don't need to be making up stuff. We need to be incredibly accurate. When we're talking to our friends, we need to be talking to them about the fact that 1,200 of our third graders aren't proficient in reading. Now, that's like every year for the last 10 years. Is that like 12,000 people? Did I do that math right? 1,200 times 10? I'm not a public school person. 
uh, on the board, my mom taught in public education. So I think I can do that math. 1,200, Tim Kaufman, the treasurer, said yes, 1,200 times 10, 12,000 third graders over the last 10 years. Okay? Do you happen to know roughly what the capacity of the Pepsi Center is? I don't know of what the Pepsi Center is. 10 or 12,000. Excellent. About 12 to 15,000. Good time and a half. So that means we could all run down, look at the Pepsi Center, next time you go to the Nuggets or the Avalanche game, the Pepsi Center, over the last 10 years, you could fill the Pepsi Center with the third graders who weren't purchasing a meeting and yet go on to fourth grade. Now, many of you know if our sheriff is here, a couple of standard candidates here, they'll tell you you kind of look at jail capacity based on the number of third graders who can't leave. So if you can't leave going into fourth grade, fourth grade on, you need to know how to read in order to learn. K123, you're learning to read. So I think it's incredibly important that we're, we're very accurate when we have conversations about what people are doing. Do you want me to take some questions, please? Okay, I think I'd be happy to do that. Um, it's also really important to be involved, I say to the people who show up at every meeting. But be involved in your school board stuff. And the next big thing that's going on with our school board is those community budget forums. There will be two on Monday night the third. The closest one up here is Evergreen. There will be two on Wednesday night the fifth. And there will be two on Saturday the eighth. If you're really ambitious, go to two. And seriously, find your friends. Talk about the things that you think are important, that you think will help our achievements improve, and help your school board understand that you are behind their openness and their transparency 100%. The next school board meeting end is March 6th. It will be held at Golden High School. Some of you know one of the things your new school board has done is they have moved their school board meetings around. They have one in Lakewood, one in Arvada. March 6th will be in Golden at Golden High School. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention this because we all want something else to do. This week on Thursday night, they have a about a two, two and a half hour meeting where they will get a budget update. That is an unusual meeting in that it doesn't start till 7 p.m. Most school board meetings start at 5.30, but if you're going to go this week, you have a pass for dinner, go down at 7 p.m. I'm happy to take questions for you. So let me be here. Great. And I might also add that out on the JeffCoTeaParties.com site, we do have a calendar that we try and keep updated out there. And it also has links to other resources on the Jefferson County School Board site. Um, we do have time for, we'll, we'll do two questions if we have any, uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Well, he's watching, I'll also mention, if you don't get emails from something called Jeffco Students First, stop and see me on your way out because they do weekly emails with what's going on from the, in the Jeffco School world. Well, regarding the budget, yeah. budget form, you know, yeah. you know, we don't have a lot of historical knowledge. Right. You know, we know that there's been several fairly significant uh, uh, increases, you know, through some of the ballot measures that won. Right. I mean, both of them, I think. Good. So, where is the budget? Do you consider that, like, I've heard some pretty crazy numbers of costs per student. Are those going up? Are they going down? And what would you recommend as the kind of thinking we should have if we should go to these forums and what issues that we might address? Okay, great question. Thank you for asking. Um, we spend about $11,400 per student in Jefferson County. $11,400. You all passed a ballot initiative in 2012 that gave you 39 extra, 39 extra million dollars per year. So that's included in that 11000 um, The school board has been told that they will get about $16 million more dollars next year. 85,000 kids, not a huge number, but it's $16 million. So you all probably want to go to that school board and say things like, when I voted to increase my taxes, I don't want you to put them in a savings account. I want you to spend them. The plan this year is to put $10 million of that $39 million in a savings account. That's not my preference. Tim, I know you love carrying reserves, and it's good, and conservatives love to feel like we're in good financial shape, but the school district is on its way to raising back up the, no the dollars in our reserves. In 2009, when I took office, 22% of our general fund spending is in a savings account. They probably won't get that high, but they're going in that direction. So if it were me, I would be telling them, spend my money. I would be also saying things like, if you're going to increase compensation, tell the people whose compensation you're going to raise 
We love you, you did a good job. Don't increase compensation just for staying around another year. So if you look at compensation, here, here's one of my other favorite things. Um, a similar was did a time at Edgewater this past weekend. Um, some of you may know that we uh, have some impoverished neighborhoods on the east side of our district. There's some all across the district, but lots on the east side. And some of the moms said this, we'd really like to have middle school sports back. Children of families who live above the poverty line have great access to things like Gold Town and Rec Center. So if you are so inclined, you might say, we'd love to have middle school sports back. Keep the kids engaged. Some of our lowest performance academic members are like seventh to eighth grade dip. Um, it may help a lot to see middle school sports back. So those would be some of my recommendations. One more question, if we have any. Anybody? Come on, that last one. Well, All right. Thank you, thank you guys so much for letting me be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Okay, and with that, we will uh, we come to um, uh, obviously I didn't edit this slide completely. So, um, but uh, with that, we're going to have the two um, uh, candidates for Jefferson County Sheriff come forward. Um, the way we're going to do this is we're going to have each of them will give a five-minute introduction. And then we are going to, I've got a couple of questions that I'm going to ask. And then after that, we will open it up to the audience for questions. And then um, we will also have a five minute kind of closing period that uh, we can do for each candidate. So um, we, this is not structured as a debate, but the reason we're having both candidates come up at the same time is because there are some questions that you may want to ask of both of them. And it just, we thought that format would provide for that a little bit easier. So with that, I'm going to invite Jim Shires to come up first. And I'll tell you a little bit about Jim. He is a native of Oklahoma. He moved to Jefferson County at age 15. He's a graduate of Columbine High School, and he joined the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department in 1985. He's been a sergeant since 2012, and he's also married. Thank you. And he's correct. I did. I like to say that I was born and raised in Oklahoma, but because I moved up here to Jefferson County when I was 15, I grew up in Jefferson County. Uh, there's a major difference there between where you're born is then where you actually learn about life. And I've basically been serving my entire working career of serving the public. Fast food restaurants and everything, and then the past 28, and tomorrow will be 28 and a half years with the Justin County Sheriff's Office. Somebody once told me, well, I'll tell you who it was. Now, Two years ago, I was told by the current undersheriff that one of the things that I probably as a fault, if you will, is that I care too much. If that's my fault, I'll take that every day of the week, that I care too much. I don't know if somebody can care too much, especially when we have pledged to serve the public and you, the taxpayer. So that being said, part of my platform is about six years ago, a national candidate ran on a slogan of hope and change. I remember that one? Yeah. For the past six years, the Justin County Sheriff's Office has been hoping for an increase in the budget, which means more of your taxpayer dollars, a change in the budget, sheriff's budget. I don't need a hope. And I don't have a hope. What I do have is a plan. I have analyzed the budget, and I've already identified at least $4 million within the current budget that I will reallocate and spend differently to keep the great men and women that we are hiring and to keep them from going to other agencies. If you paid attention to the media recently, we are hemorrhaging employees. So there's always going to be retirements, there's going to be some injuries, people are going to change and leave for whatever reason. But I'll use the low numbers that you may have heard, 48 people left, 48 deputies left last year. Okay. Many of them went to other departments. We train them, they take them. Many of them were here less than seven years. Take that number in half, let's be conservative. 
We can keep 24 of those 48 deputies at the sheriff's office. That's $2.9 million that we don't have to spend again, and it takes almost a year to get them replaced. When we start doing that, we're using your money as fiscally responsible as possible. That's part of it. Uh, real quick, uh, as far as my other, one of my other platform's issues is guns, gun rights, Second Amendment. You're going to hear almost every candidate tell you that they support the Second Amendment. They should, absolutely they should. But do they ever tell you why? I'm here to tell you why I support the Second Amendment. I believe the right to keep and bear arms is there to protect our freedoms, our First Amendment, right, and the other rights and freedoms guaranteed to us by the Constitution. If we don't protect those rights, then we're not going to have any. We've already seen the attack on our rights, and it's going to continue if we're not able to protect them. Right? I'm turning my gun right here. Right? So that's part of my platform. I have the information over there. The best way to remember my name, Shires, just think hire Shires for the job of sheriff, and we're good to go. Shires4sheriff.com. Facebook, website, uh, Twitter, all of that. So there you go, there's my intro, and I'll answer more questions later. Great, right. thank you, Jim. <laughs> and we'll also at this time have Jeff Schrader come forward. He uh, grew up in Lakewood. He joined the Jeff Sheriff's Department in 1984. He held various positions, in, and he is presently the division chief. He has a BS from Colorado uh, Christian University, and he's married with two, um, two adult daughters. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. My name is Jeff Schrader. I am a candidate for Jeff Coast Sheriff. And what I want you to know is that I'm absolutely committed to Jefferson County being as safe as it possibly can be, our schools being as safe as they possibly can be for the sake of our children, that our individual freedoms are protected, and that the jail is run in a clean, quiet, and constitutional manner. And there's always a prisoner, or there's always a bed for the prisoner who really needs to be in it. Um, a little, uh, little earlier today, I'll tell you this. Uh, gentleman was arrested, a guy named Ken Hawk, was arrested uh, in, in uh, the death of one of our sergeants. He did bond out this evening, but Ken Hawk was charged today with uh, vehicular homicide and also for criminally negligent homicide. And now that case will start to begin to proceed through the court process. Um, and uh, many people in the community have offered their support to, to our organization. I have been with the sheriff's office for a good amount of time. But we've, uh, we've seen a great outpouring uh, from the community for the support for our staff, for the support of the Baldwin family, and it is greatly appreciated. Um, one of the things that's going to come up here in another uh, couple of months is a benefit ride that will benefit this year the Baldwin family, but will likely be a, a, a standard in the springtime of the year to support uh, public safety, likely both police and fire um, for uh, for those who uh, have been put in risk and, uh, and have paid the ultimate price. Um, and the prayer is that we never have to use that fund um, when, that, when that fund is built up. But thank you for the support that uh, our, our organization has, has seen from that. Um, I, I, am, I, I am Jeff Schrader. I am married. I do have two adult uh, daughters. I do have two little girl grandchildren. And uh, a little while back, they were staying with me. Um, my, my daughter and her husband were waiting for their house to get ready. And as they waited, uh, they stayed with us about a month. And I, I was in my uniform one workday morning. And I came down the stairs, and my little granddaughter, about three years old, looked up at me and said, Grandpa Duke, and that's what she calls me, are you going to the circus? <laughs> Some days it's like that. Today, a guy called in. This is a true story. Um, a, a guy called in and he swears that he has been given the right via Harold Gray's secret will that he is the next sheriff. So Jim, we've been working really hard for, <laughs> for no good reason. <laughs> well, I'm challenging the constitutionality of that will. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, um, I have been with the sheriff's office 30 years in about another six weeks. I have been in a leadership capacity in the sheriff's office for 25 years. I have, uh, for the last 15 years, I've served at the rank of division chief. I've been the chief of the patrol and support division, or the pa patrol and investigations division, the chief of the support services division, where I administered the sheriff's $90 million budget. I've been the chief of the detention service division, where we have last year up to 1,300 prisoners in the jail. And no, we're not going to put a whole bunch of third graders in there, <laughs> just because they can't read. Um, <clears throat> but I have good, well-rounded experience in leading the sheriff's office. Last week, last Wednesday, my campaign did a telephone town hall, and perhaps some of you got a call on that. That call was pushed out to 7,700 different phone numbers, all Republican phones, people who had participated in caucuses in 2008, 2010, and 2012. We made contact with about near, just a little under 1,200 people. And one of the things that was very clear in one of the polling questions, very, very clear, is that the people of Jefferson County expect that the sheriff is experienced. I am the candidate who has leadership experience. I am the candidate who has administered more than a household budget. I've administered a $90 million budget, and we have been under budget in those years that I've administered it. I also sit on the board of directors for the Colorado County Officials and Employee Retirement Association. I've been the chairman of that board, and that organization has about $1.3 million under its control, under its management. Uh, I am the candidate who has, who has dealt with the difficult personnel matters. And there are difficult personnel matters, and there are challenges within the sheriff's office. The figure that Jim said is correct. Last year, we lost 48 deputy sheriffs. It's higher than we want. In an ideal year, an ideal circumstance, 5% attrition is about right. It represents a 20-year career, an average 20-year career. Last year, we were at about 8.5% for our attrition a little bit higher than what we really would like to be. And we do have some challenges. We do have people leaving. We have not been able to administer our merit-based step and grade program for the last five or six years. Now, we have had some adjustment applied to our budget from the Board of County Commissioners, and we have attempted to deal with the biggest problems that we have. And the biggest problem that we have had is people who have come into our organization and after, am I done with my time? Okay. We have people who have uh, who who have been with our organization five years up until we made this adjustment, who are getting paid the same as the person who came in a month ago, and it's not the best system, you know, with with that condition going on. So there are some challenges that are going to happen, and quite frankly, the challenges that are going to happen, they're going to need to be reasoned through. And experience is what's going to help get us through that. I'm Jeff Schrader. on who goes first on these questions? That's right. That's right. Okay. I, I can take this one first, if you don't mind. Um, constitutional carry, I am all for it. I find it interesting that our legislators pass some laws that, let's take right now, for example, if I was not a cop, okay, right now I would be considered illegal. Yet, I take my coat off and expose my gun, I'm legal. Why should there be a difference? 
this is my own personal feelings about this, but I don't have to buy a permit for my First Amendment rights. Why the heck should I have to buy a permit for my Second Amendment rights? I just find that interesting. So anyway, that's my stance on, I am all for constitutional courage. Thank you. And actually, what we're going to do is just at the end of the kind of speeding this up, you guys can both understand very close in the middle. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, the, so it, it's difficult to comment on a bill that's not actually out there to review what the, the details of it are. But on the concept of constitutional carry, I am supportive of that. Um, the reality is, is uh, over the course, I, I don't know the last time when somebody in our office made an arrest for somebody carrying a weapon uh, concealed illegally. I don't know when that happened. It doesn't happen with any <coughs> great frequency. Rarely does it happen. And, and the reality is, is if somebody is carrying in a constitutional manner, this would be absent of having a committee process. Uh, the, the process of law enforcement doesn't change. The probable cause still has to be there for the person carrying that gun. If somebody was a convicted felon, they're illegal. That probable cause, if we had the probable cause, it would exist. Uh, if there were other conditions, why it was, if they're charged with a domestic violence, or convicted of a domestic violence crime, they would be, be illegal to carry it. I don't know when constitutional carry will come up as a bill again later. I don't know when it will pass. It, it doesn't seem to have had the favor here in the last uh, couple of tries. But until then, we're going to administer a very fair, very efficient concealed weapon permit, concealed handgun permit process. And uh, I have worked diligently to push the fees of that down. The, the county fees have been reduced by more than 27% in the last couple of years. And um, in the future, I'll take a look at that again. And if we can be more efficient with it, we're going to reduce the fees again. Very good. Thank you, guys. Um, also, the next question was on teacher carry. Um, your thoughts on that? Obviously, we dealt with a lot of uh, gun crimes in Colorado and dealing with that in schools. Your thoughts on teacher carry? Yeah, so there was a, a bill that came up, and I have to confess, I did not have opportunity to read the bill that was in front of the legislature this year. So I'm not commenting on the bill. I'll comment on the concept of teacher carry. Um, it, it is my belief that, uh, that, that that's something that should be explored, but ultimately it's a decision of the school board. Keeping in mind this, that the sheriff has patrol responsibility only for the unincorporated areas. And to have a policy that would only affect the unincorporated areas uh, and not the incorporated areas would be a challenge at best. But... Um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought there. It'll come back in just a moment. Uh, I'll just make something up till I get my real train of thought back. Um, <clears throat> but, but generally, I, uh, I, I think that that's a, a prospect that's worth exploring. Ultimately, again, that has to be the, the role of the Board of Education to make that decision. If they do, I am not personally favorably disposed to saying that just because you have a concealed weapon permit, you should be permitted to carry. There should be a program. There should be something that uh, is coordinated so that there's an understanding of who's carrying, when they're carrying, um, and that they have some training, and that they work cooperatively with law enforcement so that there's a, a clear understanding of that. As far as teacher carry, I am aware that 11, uh, Bill 1147 was, um, did not pass, but would have prevented or allowed teachers and school boards to carry weapons in the school. Am I saying that just because somebody has a permit that they should go carry a gun in the school? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I am for teachers being able to carry. A great example of that is last December, we lost a 10-year deputy to the Littleton School District to become a teacher. He was a 10-year deputy. Should he not be allowed to carry a gun? He's a trained officer. He was a trained officer. There's military people that are now teachers. They have been trained to have to use weapons. I am not saying that anybody in the school staff that has a gun should go and confront an assailant that comes in with a gun. I am asking, though, that if a teacher has a gun 
and they hunker down in that schoolroom and protect those children when that bad guy comes through the door. That's how that can be utilized and work with local law enforcement, the sheriff's office, local police department, in that response. It's all of us working together to protect the children. The sheriff's office is doing a very good thing over expansion of the uh, office space there. And they're using um, an instrument, financial instrument, called a certificate of participation. My view on this is basically it is an instrument, much like um, fees are used to circumvent paper by calling them fees, not taxes. Uh, I, I see the COP, the uh, certificate of participation, as a way of circumventing some of the uh, paper rules. I'm just curious on what you think, uh, if you could comment on the expansion pro uh, project itself, and then also uh, any thoughts you might have on how to finance. The expansion project is on time, I believe, and from the things I've seen and the updates that I've been given, that it is progressing well. Do I agree with every part of the uh, construction project? Not necessarily, but that's a different topic. As far as how it's financed, I don't really agree with that either. There was no input from you, the taxpayers, and that's part of paper. Having that input whether it be certificate deposits, a fee, a license, a tax increase, whatever, let's be honest about it. It's coming out of your pocket. You should have a say and be aware of the entire thing before it's agreed upon. Um, <clears throat> this is a, the expansion project that's going on. It's about $34.8 million. Uh, it is a project that I have been assigned to to ensure that it stays under budget, that, that it stays within the confines of what was outlined but so that the scope doesn't creep, uh, so that the architect's egos don't get in the way uh, and build something more monumental than it really should be. Uh, here's the reality. Back in 2006, the then Board of County Commissioners authorized a master plan for the Jefferson County Sheriff's Campus, looking at what are the potential needs for certain time periods down the road. After that was done, the Board of County Commissioners, the, the, the prior Board of County Commissioners, employed what they call a blue ribbon panel. They brought in people from the community. Each commissioner had three or four folks that they brought in. It was the recommendation of that blue ribbon panel that the that the then Board of County Commissioners chose to utilize COP as they paid off the debt on the Taj Mahal, it freed up about seven million bucks a year, and they chose to use it. We quite frankly argued that they should use that for the bigger problem that we saw coming, and that was salaries of employees, some of the challenges that we're having. But the Board of County Commissioners opted to do that, the then Board of County Commissioners opted to do that, back to 2008, 2009, and, um, and they had borrowed that money for that project as well as other projects. I think the figure is about $86 million that was borrowed, and again, $34.8 million, and yet yeah, it's pretty much on time. Uh, we're running about four weeks behind weather delays and other things that come up in construction, but parts of that parts of that are coming online, but it is all consistent with the budget that the Board of County Commissioners approved. The Sheriff has no authority to approve a budget. The Sheriff just outlines what the needs are. This was done in a master plan done in 2006. It does not include any additional jail space other than a court holding facility that, that expands, and it does not require the addition of any staff. Um, I've got one last question, and then I'm going to start taking questions. So if you want to raise your hand, um, Donna, you'll be first, and then anybody else will raise your hand, and we'll take a few on that. Last question we have from me is, um, and you, you both mentioned this issue with the attrition rate with the sheriff's deputies and budgets and how that's affected. Um, it's, it's been on the news quite a bit. If you could comment on the attrition rate and uh, what your thoughts are on what needs to change. Well, you know, the, the, the primary reason, and uh, it, it's been commented and uh, 
and Jim very well may comment on this, that, that people are still leaving in spite of recent raises being given. Now, the, the raises that were administered, it was actually, we call it a salary adjustment. It was not merit-based. It was just to put some of those people in the right category, presuming that they had satisfactory performance or we would have gotten rid of them. We have put people in the right step on the lower end of the scale. People at the top end of the scale did not get raises in spite of there being room in their step to move up. Um, <clears throat> What, what uh, I believe people are looking for is compensation certainty. That they know that there's a pay for performance plan and that they're gonna be eligible for that money when, they, when, when their annual review comes around. Um, that, that has not been the case. There are, uh, I don't know when that might change, but I'll tell you this, that same Board of County Commissioners that conducted that blue ribbon panel they had done their assessment of what the recession was looking like back in 2008, 2009, and they had planned, they had thought that by 2014, we would be out of that. The county is driven by property tax. Cities are driven by sales tax. There's huge competition for qualified, well-trained law enforcement officers in the Denver metro area. And, and cities that have the ability to hire because they've rebounded a lot quicker then the county who is held back by two years, I've tried, uh, Lou does the assessments. Uh, they say that here in the next, uh, in, in the next property reset, that we are looking at likely a double digit or 10% increase in the values of homes in Jefferson County. Now that doesn't address the commercial property and, and that's a big factor of what goes on. Uh, but uh, and, until we can come up with a plan for that compensation certainty. And uh, certainly that isn't all with the Board of County Commissioners. Here's the reality uh, in another vein, is that uh, yeah, the Sheriff's Office for Deputy Sheriff last year, we saw eight and a half percent attrition. For our civilian employees, it was higher, 12 to 13 percent attrition. The Planning and Zoning Department saw 16 percent attrition because they have the same issue going on. People aren't Aren't, aren't moving up in their merit-based pay plans. And, and it's going to be a challenge for the county for years to come. Now, if these things do, do change, there likely will be uh, um, opportunity in the future, and those plans will come out of it. We've been in downward cycles before. This, quite frankly, is the longest one that, that I've ever seen, and, and it has been a particular challenge, and, uh, and some of the challenge is going to continue. But we're going to find a way to work through it. Well, I'm not going to be hoping for a 10% increase in your property taxes. Right? Um, I am going to implement a plan that I've already outlined that will stop some of this attrition. January, we lost six employees to other agencies. Two weeks ago, we had nine go down to Douglas County and fill out applications down there. These are employees that just got the raise that was just mentioned. Something else is going on. Let me give you one example. Last fall, I had one of my subordinates who wanted to be a deputy sheriff in Jefferson County. Finally, she said enough is enough of the internal issues that's going on within the sheriff's office and went down and applied at El Paso County Sheriff's Office. She got hired by El Paso County to become a deputy sheriff. We have a process at the JFCO that we will do an exit interview with people when they leave. Three times the person that was interviewing her said, it's all about the money, right? If we give you a raise, you're gonna stay, right? Three times she said no. Finally she said, sir, I mean no disrespect to you, your rank or this department. But I'm a trust fund baby. I don't need your money. I don't want your money. My mom's a prominent doctor out in Philadelphia. She can buy me a house and buy me whatever I want. It's not about the money. I want to serve as a deputy sheriff. And quite frankly, there's one person in this sheriff's office that is the leader that I would follow into a firefight, and that's Sergeant Jim Shires. That's what she told the interviewer. So the 
there's other things to go on that we can address internally without hoping for more of your taxpayer dollars to keep those people here. I, I think right now we've got to join forces and ensure that we're all on the same page within the sheriff's office so that we work together well to provide the best possible service to you, the public, the quickest service, the most trained service, the most qualified service that you need when you call for help. We've got to work together, no matter who wins this race, to make sure that you folks are getting the service that you expect and deserve. Um, I've, I've worked with Jim for a real long time. We used to party a little bit together. We, I was there when he got his nose broke. <laughs> That was a heck of a night, wasn't it? That's a different story. Um, <clears throat> Poloniously, he got his nose broke, actually. Um, we've worked together a long time. I have a great deal of respect for Jim. Uh, if it goes that direction, I'm going to do the very best I can to help the sheriff's office in any way that I can. into the weeds just a little bit, but there are certain things in, um, in government that, that we expect. We, we expect, um, number one, that the government's going to protect our individual rights. In that regard, we're going to need law enforcement. We're going to need that. Um, and we're going to need it at the right and appropriate levels. Now, uh, the Board of County Commissioners hasn't um, reallocated money from other functions to the Sheriff's Office. They haven't picked the winners and the losers, say what's the most important function. Um, but what I would tell you in this regard is there isn't anything that I've ever advocated that goes over paper limit. This is, I've said this at other events here and I'll stand by it. Last October 9th, the county commissioner sent a, a telephone survey asking people if they would support a property tax increase either to maintain or enhance the county services to include law enforcement. The answer that was given the most was no. People are tired of taxes. Be it property taxes, sales tax, employment tax, it doesn't matter, people are tired of paying these taxes. I am too. I don't want my property taxes going up. So with that being said, I will not go to the county commissioners and ask for a budget increase, more of your taxpayer dollars, until I can prove to you that every single dollar is being spent as widely as possible. Zero-based budgeting, if you want to call it that. So, no. Any additional questions? Okay, closing up on this. When it comes to leadership, I already told you a story about one person that left the sheriff's office and considered me a leader. I was treasurer of the Emergency Services Public Information Officer of the Colorado Organization. That's 80 emergency services 
providers, be it law enforcement, firefighters, ambulance, hospitals, district attorney's offices. I was treasurer of that for three years, elected treasurer by the membership. After that, I was elected president for two years by that organization as well. So I have that leadership built into me already. As far as additional platforms keeping the school safe, I have plans. Like I said, I don't have hope. I have plans to work with R1 School Security. I've already talked to them. I've already talked to a number of other agencies about ongoing yearly training together so that we can provide the quickest and best response to protect the school. We have pretty good training within the Sheriff's Office now, but we don't work with other agencies. We have the basic academy training with Lakewood and some other agencies, and the basic when they first get hired to be a law enforcement officer. But that's where the training together really stops. We've got to work together with school staff, with school administration, with R1 security, with the other agencies. Who do you think is going to be the first responding agency to Red Rock Elementary? Sheriff's Office is going to get the call because it's our jurisdiction. But the first one that's probably going to be there will be Morrison. Right? What kind of training do they have? And they don't have the personnel to go in there by themselves. So we've got to work together. We've got to know how we're going to respond and who's going to take whatever action. So that's a big part of it, providing that safety for, to the children so that they have the best, safest educational environment for them. My ultimate goal here as the sheriff would be to make Jefferson County the safest, most enjoyable county for people to live, work, and play in the entire United States. That's what it comes down to. I want people to really enjoy being in Jefferson County and feel safe doing that. You've heard a lot of bad stuff about the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office tonight. Let me tell you why you can have confidence in it. The Jefferson County Sheriff's Office is a nationally accredited organization, not in just one way, but in four different avenues. We are, we are accredited by the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, an organization that sends people in, assessors from other states, to come in and assess our capabilities to standard. We have been found in the most recent audit, we have been found to be in compliance with 100% of the standards, very rare you can have confidence in the Sheriff's Office. We, our, our jail is accredited through the American Correctional Association. Our, our medical unit in the jail is accredited through the National Commission on Correctional Healthcare. Our crime lab is accredited through the Association of uh, Crime Lab Directors. I left out something in that acronym. We think those things are important not that we just know what we need to do and we'll do it all ourselves or we'll, we'll work according to our own plan. We test our plan based upon national standards and other organizations coming in to evaluate our capacity. You can have confidence in the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office because other people have confidence in us. We, are, we have regionalized a number of our efforts. I'm proud to have been part of the effort to regionalize our training academy. We have regionalized with the Lakewood Police Department. We share resources. We have cut costs by doing that. We, we are in the process of regionalizing our crime lab. That's, that's one of those areas that's hugely expensive, and we need to be able to set the priorities for what are the highest priority crimes where our, our forensic capabilities are going to be needed. I'm very proud to have been the leading part, the leading person in making sure that that gets done. We have regionalized in other regards too. And what you can take from that is the chiefs of police in Jefferson County have confidence in the sheriff's office. You also can take confidence in the fact that we survey the people that we are in contact with. Once a quarter, based on the people that we have contact with, randomly selected people 
our census survey card. Our most recent survey, the fourth quarter of last year, came in here not too long ago. We're not perfect, but on a four-point scale, the rating overall was 3.72. We have a sound organization. We've had sound leadership. I am very proud to have been endorsed by Sheriff Ted Nix. I'm very proud to have been endorsed by former Sheriff Ron Beckham. I'm proud to have been part of both of their leadership teams. I'm very proud to have been endorsed by District Attorney Pete Weir. All of these men have endorsed me because I have the experience and I have the demonstrated effectiveness. And quite frankly, either you're going to be voting when you when you go and you're a delegate, you're going to be voting for an ex, for experience, or you're going to be voting for an experiment. Because anything less, if you don't know what that experience is, you don't know what you're going to get. I'm Jeff Schrader. I believe I'm the best qualified candidate to be Jeffco's next sheriff. I'm asking for your support. I'm asking for your confidence, and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you, Jeff Trader over here, and Jim Sire. Okay, just kind of a couple a couple of things here for a wrap up. We do have uh, the five tea parties. Again, please do check out the Jeffco Tea Party. Dot com website and um, next time please bring a friend thank you very much for coming tonight and we appreciate you uh, being here i hope you enjoyed the evening next month again we will have a very full schedule we've got uh, two gubernatorial candidates and a u.s senate candidate we hope you'll join us again thank you very much <laughs>